She referenced us and said, hey, I've got a friend that's wanting to do a PPP forgiveness website. And I said, okay, Jill, it's done great. She's like, well, I've got a few criteria for you though. You guys are going to have to build it and kind of pay for most of it. Like, well, this doesn't sound like a good deal, Jill. I mean, I'm a little busy. I was like, uh, Jill, who's your friend? She's like, Mark Cuban. I was like, Jill, done. <laughs> All right. Welcome to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. Thanks for tuning in from wherever and however you're tuning in with us today. Be sure to like, subscribe, share with friends, family, mother-in-law, um, anybody who you think would enjoy the Startup Junkies podcast. My name is Caleb Talley. I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel. How's it going? It's going well. How are you doing? All right. And Jeff? Glad to be here. Beautiful, beautiful Monday in Northwest Arkansas. And we are joined by our friend, uh, Joe Earhart of Tesla Software. How's it going? Great. Thanks for having me. That's Air Heart. That is correct. <laughs> e- easy, easy to say, hard to spell. No, yep. I will, I will say that's how you know it's from the seventh century. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Joe, how we kind of kick off uh, the podcast typically is, you know, we uh, invite our guests to uh, jump into their origin story. You know, if you were a Marvel comic book character, you know, where where is your prequel? Man, <laughs> I wish I had a really cool origin story, but I you think washed the, up on the shore. Yeah, but <laughs> no, ours is kind of lame. It's pretty simple. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not a very risky person on stuff. I had a great job, worked for a great bank, and that bank failed in the crisis in 2008. Mm-hmm. So I was like, man, if there's ever an opportunity to start something, I'm already fired. Might as well try. And so I got lucky enough um, that bank, uh, when they failed, got owned by the FDIC. And the FDIC actually needed consultants. So I started mm. a, a company called 3E that's now Tesla um, mm. to go out and help the FDIC. So, you know, one door closes, another opens, and you just kind of take it from there. But, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I always tell my wife, I said, things sometimes at the time seem like they suck. I'm like, man, this, I wish this wouldn't have happened. This has really ruined the trajectory I wanted to be on. But honestly, it always opens a better door if you can positively think about it and take mm. advantage of it. And so mm-hmm. we took that kind of failure set back and turn it into what's Tesla today. Let's roll it back even a little farther yeah. though. I mean, you kind of grew up in banking. Weren't you a teller at one point when, yeah. you, were, when you were in high school and college? Yeah, when I was, when I was 16, 17, I grew up in Pea Ridge. And mm-hmm. so to make money, um, I worked in the fields cutting thistles. If you know what those are, if you don't, they suck. Uh, it's a hundred <laughs> degrees. You're wearing long sleeves, long pants, gloves. Also cleaned out chicken houses and other uh, feed mills, nothing great. And uh, when I was about to be a senior in high school, the bank called and said, hey, Joe, we, we know your mom. Uh, she's a hairdresser. You're a great student. Would you like to be a teller? Mm-hmm. Air conditioning, counting money. <laughs> this is a way better than cutting thistles. And so I did that, and uh, I've been in banking ever since. So I realized in 2024, that will be 25 years. So that wow. was 1999. Wow. 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 And he managed to get a computer science, computer engineering degree at the U of A as well. That's where the yeah. the computer knowledge came from, right? Yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut, but couldn't afford to go to any place cool. So I was like, well, computers, that sounds cool at the U of A. <laughs> I went there and, uh, you know, had no idea what to do. Tried to actually do everything I could to not be in banking. I applied at like four jobs. I remember applying at J.B. Hunt. They said, get lost. <laughs> and so I was like, man, I'm never getting out of this. And I'm so glad they said, get lost. Yeah, they're sponsoring it. <laughs> no, oh, I'm sorry. It's it's kind of great like, company. It's kind of like, they told me to get lost. It's kind of like being in the mafia. You can never leave, right? I never could you, leave. You're, you're a made man now. You got to stay. Yeah. You know, I had a teacher that always told me, never do anything for more than five years. He said, two years to be good at it one year to get really paid and two years to get the hell out of it. <laughs> He's like, if not, you'll be doing it for your whole life. <laughs> it just stuck. It did. So here we are. Very cool. So I guess a piece of advice that um, I've heard given to entrepreneurs before who are looking to kind of start a business in a field industry sector um, is to go and work in that space for a period of time to really understand it. So you that just came naturally to kind of have some banking background. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a pro and a con there that you got to mm-hmm. be careful about. Mm-hmm. You want to know enough of the space to know where the challenges are, mm-hmm. but not so much to be locked into the path everybody's going, right? So one of the best mm-hmm. things we like is we like to take new people who don't understand banking and throw them at a challenge. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes they'll think about things others don't think about. A lot of times if you worked in industry long enough, you'll be like, well, that's the way it's always been. Mm-hmm. And you lack that creativity mm-hmm. to get out of it. Mm-hmm. So um, no, I think it's great for entrepreneurs to to be in the field they're in, but not too much in the field sometimes. Mm-hmm. Or you get somebody who has outside thoughts, who can think mm-hmm. through the problems differently. Uh, I think that's critical, actually. So you're just like living by a playbook. 
yeah. like get outside of that mindset, I guess. Yeah, you know, one of the rules I always tell people is if you can deliver something to them, if, if a person asks you for A and you deliver A, you failed. If they ask for A and you can deliver something they never thought of that solves A, that's success. Mm-hmm. And so I tell my engineering team that all the time. Don't, don't deliver what the customer asked for. Deliver what they didn't expect that solved what they wanted plus more. Hmm. That's yeah. really how you're going to get those raving fans and those customers to give you more ideas. Unless you're a restaurant. Well, I guess. <laughs> you know what? I've never worked in a restaurant. I went from thistles to banking. I don't actually have a clue. In fact, I will tell you, my wife says, what's the thing you hate to do the most? I hate cooking. Okay. No. So I don't cook unless it's mac and cheese. <laughs> is That's, there a market for thistles? I, I just can't get I know. Yeah, what, I know. What do you do with that? I think that the yeah. thistle is actually like the national flower of Scotland, something, but it it's is. a freaking uh, weed, right? Uh, but is a, there a market for it? It's a market to kill it. To kill oh, it. Okay. Oh, yeah. right. So, so right. you were the guy that had the roundup that was out there. Yeah. So if you let I thistles gotcha. grow in your, if you don't know anything about thistles, if they grow in the field, the cows won't eat them. Uh-huh. Right. So they'll just keep uh-huh. spreading uh-huh. and they just keep taking land that the cows won't go. And it's a really, yeah, I mean, it's an invasive. Or something and so like, it just, yeah. it keeps growing and taking over the field. It was, I believe it was the national flower. Scotland, don't quote me on this, maybe totally yep. wrong. Because yep. they could plant them and horses wouldn't go through them. So it was a defense oh. metric. Well, that same, that same that thing sounds works. like something yeah. my ancestors would do. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ah, yeah. we're going to bugger the English on this one. <laughs> plant thistles. <laughs> I yeah. honestly think that's why, but that's yeah. when, what you're doing is you you're actually going out and cutting them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they cut the ribbons, right? <laughs> Reminds uh, me of Monty Python. <laughs> anyway. My uh, first job was picking peaches, and I often wore long sleeves and pants just because, like, not Now, where are, you, where are you from? I'm East Arkansas. I was thinking, like, Delta. is this like a Georgia thing? Yeah, no, not no. from Georgia, but um, there's hardly any peach orchards there anymore, but probably like 12, 13 year, 12 or 13 years old and had to wear long sleeves, not because of like the same aspect of thistles because peaches right off the tree, they already have fuzz, but that fuzz falls off over time. So by the time you get to like, you fill up your sack full of peaches, you are so itchy from all of that peach. Yeah, it's that itchy. Oh, yeah. so oh, no itchy. That's that's terrible. Itchy. So just a tangent there. And this um, is the positive yeah. side of GMO. That's yeah. where nectarines yeah. came from. It's yeah. like yeah. enough of the fudge. Yeah. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, Joe, um, one, one. Yeah. well, get, get us back on track. Yeah. Well, yeah. For on, any of our, uh, don't be that guy. Um, but for any of our listeners out there who have never heard of Tesla or don't know what you do, can you maybe just tell them what it is you you guys do? Yeah, we don't make car software. That's the first thing people usually ask. <laughs> yeah, it's like, really it cooler to, than that. Yeah, yeah. So Tesla, are, at the end of the day, people are like, how did you get the name? I'm an engineer. I'm a nerd. I liked Tesla the person, not the, the mm-hmm. car company. I liked mm-hmm. the car company too, but I, it mm-hmm. wasn't directly related mm-hmm. to that. And I came up with an idea of three products way back in 2008. One of them was going to be called Tesla, I added R to it, about exception software. And like, what the hell is an exception? Well, in banking, if you've ever bought a house or bought a car, you signed a bunch of paperwork. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, there's somebody at that bank that has to look at all that paperwork and say, did you do it right? And if you did anything wrong or everything, anything was missed, we called that an exception. Hmm. And so Tesla was originally created to help bankers figure out on paper processes what was missing. And it's grown from there. Today, essentially, I think we help over half the banks in this state, 33 bank, uh, states and counting. We have banks in. And essentially, we do everything you can imagine from the start to the end of a loan. Okay. Have everything from the first day they may meet you, putting it in like a CRM, to making the actual document you sign, et cetera. And we do all things in between. Hmm. So it's a lot of, I would call it nothing fancy or beautiful on the, that you see as the user, but very critical for um, mm-hmm. especially community banks. Mm-hmm. So how does a, a bank down the street with 100 people compete with the Bank of America? Mm-hmm. So the bank down the street has maybe a billion in assets if they're mm-hmm. a bigger community bank. Mm-hmm. But you know, JP Morgan is $3 trillion in assets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a massive scale difference there. Mm-hmm. How do you let them compete? It's technology. Mm-hmm. That bank can have the right tech so that they can service you anywhere in the country, the same as Bank of America. And that's our job. Our job is to help community banks have the technology to compete against the big banks so that they're still there. Because at the end of the day, if you need a small business loan, you're starting out, you have a lot easier time getting that loan from a community bank than you would from a big bank. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. they're willing to look at you yeah. as a person, the community, what's it look like, instead of just what does the computer model mm-hmm. say the mm-hmm. likelihood of you paying back is. Mm-hmm. And in the community banks, I would say, you know, the kind of been an institution in that community. They rise being from East Arkansas in the peach orchards, yeah. but you know, kind of their relationships with the farmers they support and the small businesses that kind of just, you know, it's very community focused. How's Tesla kind of been a part of uh, the community there in Springdale too? Kind of how are y'all integrated into that 
community. Yeah, I mean, I was born in Fayetteville, mm-hmm. and so people are like, really? I was like, yeah, I was born at the old Washington Regional, <laughs> not the current one. Uh, so I was born and raised Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I don't actually take one town and call it home. I call it mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. I went to school in Bentonville, uh, Rogers, Mm-hmm. Um, ironically, Elkins. I never went to school in Springdale, but my you're kids have been ult- going. You're the uh, ultimate Northwest Arkansas. I just kind of jump around. I graduated <laughs> yeah. from P Ridge, and so to me, it's just like, how can we? A couple of things as a startup. How can we grow a cool startup ecosystem? Mm-hmm. I think that's critical. Uh, you know, the next tech co- innovation, and then two, how can we be long lasting? So it's not just we're not just building a tech company so that Joe can get a you know a seven figure payout and go about his way and buy a boat and sell off. But how do we actually have a long impact? Um, as someone born and raised in Northwest Arkansas, I want to see that. And yes, we definitely have some awesome long impact companies like Walmart, Tyson, JB Hunt. You mm-hmm. can go on um, and, and name quite a few. But how do we get that next generation? How do we get mm-hmm. that next Walmart and stuff? And so mm-hmm. for us at Tesla, you know, we're dedicated to growing here. Uh, we're building a building in the, the, the mm-hmm. you know Springdale. Um, I love Springdale because my kids go to school there, mm-hmm. and I move so many schools that I promise I never move my kids. And so that's kind of the focus on Springdale. Mm-hmm. They started there. We're going to stay there. It's a great community. But reality is Northwest Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I, I, I'd be fine with if we had to have a headquarters in Rogers, Benville, I wouldn't care. Mm-hmm. In fact, our first location um, outside of Springdale was in Benville. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. follow on, follow yeah. on to that a little bit. And you, you've had an interesting history. You've been kind of a, a classic venture scale company. You took a little bit of investment. You're, you're moving right along. You're making great progress. And then we have this black swan event. That's yeah. the pandemic. And the whole world, I can remember on March 12th of 2020, we get this information from Business Insider and it said something like 75% of all small businesses have less than three weeks of available cash. And so everybody's kind of standing on the roof saying, this is gonna be the end of the world for the, the basis of the economy if we don't get cash infused to them since the government's ordering them to shut down. You guys played kind of a principal role in some of that. Talk a little bit about what you did during the pandemic, how you responded to it, what you rolled out, you know, the PPP stuff. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably the one thing in Tesla we could write a crazy book on. I bet you could. <laughs> I mean, there, there's some crazy stuff and, and some things we can't talk about yet, but sure. hopefully will. Sure. Um, but essentially, right before the pandemic, Tesla was at its, if you look at venture scaling, like I raised capital, I raised another round. I'm getting ready for an A. My growth is exactly where I want it to be. The rule of 40 is looking amazing. I mean, that was Tesla in March of 2020 mm-hmm. uh, when all PPP happened, uh, or excuse me, COVID happened. Um, and then when COVID happened overnight, every deal died. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, we like to joke we were at the last conference that existed. We were in Orlando <laughs> like the day, like the weekend before the government shut everything down. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, and so honestly for us, we were scared. We like, what do we do? You know, we, we have been on, the, and if you're a, a startup company on that path, then you should be burning money because why did you raise it if you're not going to burn it? Mm-hmm. So that means we're burning capital, but now the growth is going to fall mm-hmm. off. So we got a little panic. So we said, okay, there are about seven banks that we know really well that are influencer. Could we help them with this new thing called PPP that came out in round one? And so we gave it to them for free. Mm-hmm. Now we gave it to them for free. We didn't make any money. Mm-hmm. And we realized like, okay, we only got four of them to sign up and they were happy, but we realized real quickly, like, man, forgiveness is actually going to be the hard part. Mm -hmm. Getting money from the government's one thing, having them say you're forgiven, Mm -hmm. we think will be the hard part. And so we put all our engineers to work on that. um, And um, a lady named Jill Castilla out of um, still, or excuse me, out of Oklahoma called us with her bank from Citizens. And she referenced us and said, hey, I've got a friend that's wanting to do a PPP forgiveness website. And I said, okay, Jill, it's, I'm great. She's like, well, I've got a few criteria for you though. I need you to build a website that can help people, people do PPP forgiveness. Let's not use his name too much because he doesn't like that. And you guys are going to have to build it and kind of pay for most of it. Like, well, this doesn't sound like a good deal, Jill. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little busy. I was like, uh, Jill, who's your friend? She's like, Mark Cuban. I was like, Jill, done. <laughs> like, done overnight. Him. And yeah. so we, one of the rules I have is if I was ever on Shark Tank and I went to Mark Cuban and he was, I know he's not on Shark Tank anymore. I think he's this last season or something. Oh, well, but if, if he ever said, Joe, 50% and I'll be on and be like, I don't care. It's yours. 50%. <laughs> like, just because people like that are going to have a major impact if you do right by them. They have a good mm-hmm. network. And, mm-hmm. and at the end of the day, a lot of business is networking. Right. right. And right. so we did right by Jill, who, who did great for us. And we did right by 
uh, of Mark Cuban. We delivered the forgiveness website. It was actually kind of chaotic. Um, Jill called us like, I don't remember what week it was. And she said, hey, when can you have it done? It was like, give us like three weeks. Two days later, I think it was a Tuesday, if I remember correctly, she called us and said, hey, is there any chance you'd be done by Thursday? I'm like, no, there's no way in hell we're going to be done by Thursday. She's like, well, the press is coming on Thursday. And so we stayed up for 48 hours straight, coded that thing like it was, and we got it up and running. And I remember we deployed it. It went, Forbes wrote an article about it. And the Amazon, we had Amazon Web Services set up with it. We had one server, and the next thing we know, in like 10 minutes, it was scaled to 10 servers. Because wow. the volume just went through the roof. Wow. At the whole time, we made zero dollars off that hmm. um, because forgiveness. With it. But what it did do was later on, there were a lot of fintechs that did PPP. And those fintechs needed bank partners. Those banks did not trust the fintechs hmm. and said, we need a provider that we can trust. Well, those fintechs were clever enough to say, well, people like Mark Cuban. Let's see who he is. And so Mark then referenced back to Jill. Jill sent it to us. We ended up processing for those fintechs and the banks liked us because we were a bank company. Hmm. So that all the banks, and we ended up processing around 22% of all the PPP loans in the nation. That's oh, incredible. Wow. It was it, over a million loans. Right? It was $22 billion wow. that we moved through the network wow. over a couple million loans. And it all came from the fact that we did something for free yep. without mm -hmm. expecting a return. Mm -hmm. We did something that we thought, okay, this could make sense. We we didn't say, hey, Mark or, or Jill, you got to yeah. pay us a million dollars to do this. We just said, well, they're going to do it and hope it comes back to us. And at the end of the day, it did. It, it kind of literally ended up being a Series A for Tesla. Yep. We were able to buy out most of our investors from the revenue we made. We, hmm. we processed over 2.2 million loans. And the other thing for us, forget the money Tesla made or the impact in Northwest Arkansas. We helped over 2 million small businesses. The mm -hmm. Biden administration really focused on that version to go after what we call, like if you're a bank, you have a priority, a fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. If a person comes in to, if I have two people come in, one of them has a $10 million loan and one has a $100,000 loan, who am I supposed to help? I mean, you have a fiduciary duty to help the $10 million first because that has the biggest impact on your capital. Mm -hmm. It just makes logical business sense. Mm -hmm. So what was happening is a lot of sole props so proprietors were getting missed because they just weren't high enough. The banks are like, I can't mm -hmm. get to you. And so what a lot of the fintechs did, as long as they, I mean, they get a bad rep for it, for some of it, because there was fraud involved, absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. But they really went down and helped the person that needed the $10,000. Mm -hmm. That was an Uber driver, or they were a, uh, you know, an interior decorator that helped people rearrange their closets. Mm -hmm. You don't think about it, but they're making their living that mm -hmm. way. And they don't have a way to support themselves when you can't go and meet people. And well, so, I, can, I can guarantee you a lot of those businesses would be deader than dead had yes. they not had that support in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. So most of the loans, we talk about the two million, a lot of those were those consumer loans. We also mm -hmm. help banks across the nation. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's a, that's a long-winded but short version of it. Some crazy nights in there. And trust me, there were a couple of times, if you've, if you've never, if you think about $22 billion in a short time we moved it, there were days we'd sent $100 million ACH files out. And we're like, God, I hope there's not a typo. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not a couple extra days. <laughs> no typos. We didn't mess this up. Where's it going? Wow. Oh, man. And I think, Amazing. And we talk about this a lot on, on the show, but I think a part of that is, is part and parcel of um, – kind of the ecosystem that we do have here where there is a, it's just kind of ingrained and being so ingrained Northwest Arkansas um, as a individual to just support and add value and give and kind of lift. Yeah. Um, and I think that just is a prime example of that. And it's just like add value where you can add value and help regardless of the scenario and then have that rewarded back over time. Yeah. I mean, you may help somebody, you may do 15 times where you do something and you never get a return. Mm -hmm. But if you're expecting it, I used to say, if you expect it, you're never getting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just go oh, yeah. do, do what you need to get done. Mm -hmm. Do what's right. You know, I love, there's lots of people have company cultures, but I like the thing, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. tell my, I tell my mm -hmm. folks that like, listen, if the customer's calling up, it says on number the wall, one, right there. Oh, right there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. but, it's, but it's so easy to get away. Like, let's say I give you a great example. The other day we had a goal of the company. We need renewals to look like this. We want this dollar amount. We had a customer that needs to cut down they, their bank. The interest rate market hasn't been good to them. Well, you know, the first thing our, our CA might say to me is like, hey, well, we can't give them a decrease in price. That's going to violate objective one. Like, well, wait a minute. What are they using? How are they using? Mm -hmm. What should they be appropriately charged? Do the right thing. It'll uh, Yes, it'll hurt goal one, but I guarantee you they'll be a long-term customer and they'll probably help us in the end. Mm -hmm. so and they'll just, have other good things to say about you. Absolutely. To other people. Yeah. 
I that's think a healthy way to look at it. And I think, uh, you know, you guys work a lot of startups. I think that can get lost real fast when you're like, I got to hit this number to yeah. get my next raise. Mm-hmm. Well, you do the PPP forgiveness loans and everything else. Um, tell us a little bit more about what Tesla Art does. Yeah. So after PPP, which was completely chaos. Yeah. I mean, and one thing people don't realize, and we, we didn't brag about it till now, but we processed all that, was, was that much volume with 30 staff. Which is nuts. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah, it it's was crazy. it was crazy. So it was and and, and remotely. Mm. I hated a lot of it. A lot of it was remote. Some of it we came in and just risked it. You know, we got to yeah. do it. Uh, and we've grown a lot since then. But you know, Tesla today, after PPP, we can finally we could breathe. And you know, it's still there's still things today we deal with on uh, requests for data, what's going on here. So it, it's not done done, but it's pretty much done. What we're doing today, what we're focused on today is where we see community banks my opinion right now, the number one area community banks stink at. Go down the street to any amazing community bank in Northwest Arkansas and go get a small business loan or commercial loan. They're great. Go ask them to go help you finance a $5,000 unsecured, any consumer loan. And most of them are god awful at it. Mm-hmm. And the reason is they've not invested in the technology because they don't make a lot of money there. Mm-hmm. Um, number two is they feel like you would got served anywhere uh, somewhere else already. And so they just know to put a lot of uh, thought in it. And if you backwards up, kind of reverse a little bit, they had the same mindset after um, some of the new rules came out around um, mortgages, which we call TRID, which is an acronym of acronyms. And so what'd they do? They didn't invest in it. So what happens? A tech company, you could call them a tech company, called Rocket Mortgage, came out and ate their lunch, <laughs> right? Why is it that Rocket Mortgage has not been in the industry, just makes some tech and destroys the market share of mortgages. Well, the reasoning is, is community banks didn't invest in the technology. And so one of our big pushes right now is we're trying to build a whole LOS, which is called loan origination, is how banks make loans start to finish. Mm-hmm. How do they get it done? And one of our major goals is to really help community banks get consumer loans. Now, consumer loans don't make a lot of money, so why does it matter? Mm-hmm. Because the consumer down the street that you lend the $5,000 to is the next person to own a small business that's in a large business. And if you don't get the top of the funnel, you won't have the end of the funnel. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that I'm pushing community banks hard on. It's like, yeah, to think about the top of the funnel. You don't want them all pulling up Bank of America and be mm-hmm. like, well, that's where I'll get my small business mm-hmm. loan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, community banks will argue, well, we, 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 we short circuit that by you know, going to the country club, meeting people where they're at. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, mm-hmm. that's changing. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. not, not, not everybody's going to networking events like we used to. Yeah. We can do a lot of stuff remotely. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. how are we get in front of them? Particularly people of Daniel's age, they're not going to, they don't, they're not going to go into a branch and do this. They're going to, mm-hmm. ex- you're going to expect it online. Yeah, a lot exactly. Of time, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it, do you think it's too late for these community banks to invest in that technology? Absolutely not. Because community banks, PP, COVID and slash PPP showed one thing. And I think this is community bank's still biggest strength. If I called Bank of America, and let's say I was a big customer, at least I feel like I'm a big customer, maybe I'm a million dollar revenue business. I feel pretty big, I feel like I've made it. I call Bank of America, I'm just a number. Mm-hmm. I call my community mm-hmm. bank, they're Johnny on the spot. Mm-hmm. What do you need? Mm-hmm. How you get? There's something to be said when you're in an oh crap situation, mm-hmm. you want a name and a face you mm-hmm. can call. And I think community banks absolutely offer that in commercial lending. My, my thing to them though is like, let's get to the top of the funnel. Let's help those folks out that can be your next business. Let's not just ignore them because we run the risk of, of driving off the, we're not seeing the long tail curve, the long tail cycle. Mm-hmm. Let me ask a follow-up yeah. to that. It's kind of a structural issue about the health of community and regional banking in general. So we all saw Silicon Valley Bank failed. Yeah. Security Bank out of New York failed. There was that margin spread because of how high the interest rates were and some of the things that they did on deposits and bonds it felt all screwed up for a while. Like we were going to have a cascading series of bank failures. What's the current, as somebody that's really close to it, what's the current state of the state, so to speak, in terms of the health of community banks? Yeah, so in banking, we talk about risk all the time. There's reputation risk, there's interest rate risk. Those banks that failed literally just failed 101 accounting, honestly. (laughs) You don't put, you don't lock up, you don't lock up depositors money and other things and capital into things you can't get it out of that yeah. where the rates might go up. And, and you got to expect the, I don't even, I still don't understand. You know, the rates were going to go up at some point. They right. can't stay there forever. Right. Historical trends. And we know rates will go down and they'll go back up. Sure. So that was very different than when we had a collateral 
failure, and you could call it you could call it whatever you want, but essentially I call it a collateral failure, aka we had devaluation in the real right. estate market. That affects everybody mm -hmm. instantly. Mm -hmm. um, today, most community banks are very stable. The fear of the commercial real estate, that was the big fear, right. hasn't really developed that I've seen. Obviously, you can go to a lot of people smarter than me, uh, Moody's and others, the analysts, you know, do it. But most markets have been pretty untouched. I mean, there are certain markets that have some issues, but now community banks, if you looked over all balance sheets, very strong. Most bank failures that you've seen recently have been fraud. There was a bank that failed at crypto scam, believe mm. it or not. I don't know if you read about that one, <laughs> but- uh, They bought uh, too much doge. <laughs> well, it, it was worse. You they could got, never have too much doge. They got, uh, <laughs> they got uh, what's it called? Pig butchering. <laughs> Wait, what now? So pig butchering, you ever heard of this? It's, yeah. where, it's where it's where a scammer gets to know you real well, tells you if you invest in this, you put some money in it, huh. it returns really well, and they want a little bit more, huh. and you invest some more, and then they give you a great return, and then they say, well, we can do a bigger deal, and you get greedy. Mm -hmm. So they're fat. They're called it's called pig butchering because I'm fattening uh, you up. Yeah. Pig. And then at the end, I'm gonna butcher you. Yeah. And there was a bank that was pig butchered where the the CEO was illegally using. I say illegal because it's being charged. Um, this is all public. Was illegally uh, using allegedly uh, the <laughs> bank's funds for this scam, oh. thinking he was going to make this big return, and mm -hmm. then he got butchered. Dang. And wow. then the bank doesn't have any capital, and the government has to close it. Hmm. Wow. So that's the one of the craziest ones. But there's not a lot of. But overall, pretty solid. Pretty yeah. stable. I think yeah. you're going to see. Um, I hate it because it lowers my customer base, but I think you'll see mergers and acquisitions. Some already consolidation. Mm -hmm. yeah, consolidation is going to pick back up. Yep. Hmm. That's just because the number one tool for consolidating is bank stock price. That's the capital they use to buy, and stocks are up or coming up. Gotcha. You mentioned uh, you had a staff of about thirty when y'all kind of were, yeah. you know, you know, hitting the the fan um, previously. What's the staff look like now? And tell us a little bit about the space that's coming together there in Springdale. Yeah, it's uh, sixty-five today. We're hoping by the time the building opens in October of, of twenty twenty-five, um, we'll be about a hundred. Mm -hmm. um, one of our things we're very keen on is I own indirectly. We've got we got about five percent of the stock cat, uh, the stock table is owned by investors that have already been bought at once, and they've got mm -hmm. just kind of just house money. Mm -hmm. And then the employees own about three to five percent, so I own mm -hmm. the rest. And so to me, it's you know we've been looking at let's just get to profitability. Mm -hmm. We don't need to raise capital, and so that's our goal. We're mm -hmm. going to stay profitable, so we're not going to out hire ourselves. And so mm -hmm. our goal is to just keep growing mm -hmm. and growing a great company. So our staff's going to reflect that. You know, there's a lot of startups that it's a bragging right how many employees you have. Hey, I've got 100 employees. Mm -hmm. got the next thing you know, they're dropping 50 of them. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what right. we call yeah. cash incinerators. Yeah. Yes. yes. They figure out how to take piles yeah. of $100 bills and set them on fire <laughs> yeah. without delivering good results. So our goal is to not do that. We, yeah. we definitely have things we want to work on, objectives, but we're trying to make sure that we stay, um, you know, a long-term profitable business, but profit isn't our goal. It's still growth, mm -hmm. uh, but where we're turning a profit so we don't have to incinerate cash. Mm -hmm. um, last thing is people always ask me is like, are you for sale? No, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we will never sell, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a math guy. I love math. <laughs> I can do math really well. If you offered me, you know, 30X, it's gone. Cheers. And then right. at 30X, would that also be when you came in to endow the Startup Junkie Foundation? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. But you know, it's, 30X is a moving 30X. It's not a number. People are like, so when I get this 31X, number, it's yeah, always okay. 30X, right? Like, yeah. No matter what the revenue is, it's 30X. Very cool. cool. That would be worth a shot. You know? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I might need to pay for my, I got four daughters. So I got like four <laughs> weddings mm -hmm. and four colleges. That, yeah. That's that, I might need a few dollars for that. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> might, <laughs> frankly, these days. <laughs> well, you mentioned growing, but not too fast. And then um, just doing the right thing as part of your company's culture. How else do you just build a strong culture? So we actually have six cultural items. Three of them are hireable and fireable. On. And I can repeat them off the top of my head because we try to push them all day. Culture value, number one, and they're actually in order. We think it's very critical to tell people, here's what we expect, and this is the order in which you are to evaluate what we expect. The number one is trust. We hold a lot of data for a lot of banks. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of things for our banks. Um, in fact, lending, believe it or not, if you've ever been a teller, you know what I'm talking about. People get mad for lots of situations, but when they can't get to their money, they get oh, yeah. really mad. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, they get mm. furious. They feel like their security's threatened. Mm, yep. And so trust is our number one. I, I joke with people all the time, like if you ask to borrow two batteries and I say, yeah, go for it. If you steal two batteries, I'll fire you. Yeah. I don't care how much you make. If I can't, if I can't trust you to not mm. tell me about borrowing two batteries, mm. I can't trust you with anything. 
And so trust is number one. Number two is have your, your everyone's back. So I want to trust somebody and I want to have their back. So that means we want open, conserve, or is it open, corrective, or a better way to say is we want to, we want people to have open feedback. Constructive is the word mm-hmm. I was looking for there. It took me a second to find it. <laughs> well, open, constructive feedback. Sometimes that feedback can be hard to hear. Mm-hmm. But if I know I have your back, we can do it. Mm-hmm. We don't want to beat around the bush. We want to, we want to be able to give blunt feedback knowing that I have it in your best interest. And so if I trust you, then you can give me open feedback. So then the third one is FITFO, figure it the F out. I'll let you figure out what the F stands for. And uh, I stole that from another startup. We love it. Scan in April. Yes, I did. That's exactly (laughs) who I stole it from. And it's absolutely, I think, critical. Yeah. So like the other one, I remember this very well. And this poor person, I won't say his name. But one, one day we were like, hey, the water cooler's empty. Who didn't put the $5, the five gallon jug on there? And so I said, who didn't do that? One of the guys like, I couldn't, I didn't know how to do it. I was like, FITFO it and go figure it out. And if you can't put on the, if you can't get the water in the water jug, then you don't need to work here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But we put in that order on purpose to say, FITFO doesn't mean you're by yourself. Somebody has your back that Mm -hmm. you can trust. Right. And we put it in that order. So figure if out doesn't mean like, oh, I can't go to Joe. No, absolutely come to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, come to me, ask me a question. I'm here to help. Yeah. And we have your back. Now, if you ask me the same question twice, I'm going to be like, did you write the answer down? Because if you come back to me a third time, it's going to be bad, mm-hmm. right? Like, there's an expectation yeah. too. We don't have time to <laughs> yeah. BS with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We want to, so that's the other three are very typical ones that you would expect. Those are the three hire and fire. If All you right. can't do those, we will hire, we will hire people on those three and we'll fire mm-hmm. people on those three. Mm-hmm. So Joe, uh, one way we, we like to land the plane on the, uh, on the podcast is we invite our guests to hop in their time machine, go back in time, whether that's, you know, before 3E or even back when you were harvesting thistles uh, with all the accumulated knowledge that you have now, what advice would you give young Joe? First off, you don't harvest thistles, you kill them. Yeah, you <laughs> harvest them to die. <laughs> I had my 10-year-old stepdaughter pulling weeds this weekend, and she was like, what do I do with them? I said, you set them over to the side to, to dry out in the sun. I mean, I honestly don't know. This sounds weird, but I'm kind of one of those people, like, I'm happy where I'm at. So I don't know if I would tell young Joe anything different because I like the path I took. But I would give advice to folks that are struggling in business because business is freaking hard. Mm-hmm. Like I tell people as a CEO, they're like, well, it must be so great to be the CEO. I was like, you know what sucks about the CEO? Unless I want ostriches <laughs> around my company. Everyone tells me everything that's bad. Nobody walks up to me and says, Joe, this is the best freaking day of my life. They're like, so-and-so made fun of me. So-and-so didn't use it. Somebody didn't refill the toilet paper in the bathroom. I mean, whatever the, you know, everything rolls up to me. And, and, and I'm like, you can relate to some of that. Yeah. Can't you, Caleb? And so it's, it's, you know, it's hard to get all that and keep persisting. Mm-hmm. But you know, one of my favorite books is The Hard Things About Hard Things. Yeah. Um, and I love that book because no offense to books like Good to Great, mm-hmm. but it's not like, it's not full of like advice. Like it's, I love the, the line that Hard Things About Hard Things, but like, you know, Joe, the best advice is hire smart people. Well, no crap. <laughs> Who's hiring idiots? Well, crap, I've been hiring dumb people this whole time. <laughs> the whole time I should hire idiots. But, but I hate books like that sometimes Sorry. because it's not the real challenges. Yeah. The real mm-hmm. challenge is you don't, sometimes you have bad choices. You know, this person's going to be okay, but this person, neither is great, but your startup's not doing great. So you mm-hmm. don't have a lot of good choices. You don't mm-hmm. have a lot of capital. It's just taking all that in and persisting. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. keep going. You know, I think people ask me all the time, like, why didn't you sell Tesla when, when you had all this PPE success? It's like, well, I kind of like building stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm an engineer. I like mm-hmm. to keep adding on to it. Mm-hmm. Now, one day that building could be something different. It could mm-hmm. be Tesla goes a different route and I go and build something mm-hmm. else. But as my wife will tell you, I don't ever plan on retiring. I like to build things. And I just want to tell people when it gets hard, just keep trying to plow through it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I have found, I, you know, I hate sports analogies sometimes, but <laughs> in baseball, it's true. If you just keep swinging, you're going to hit a home run once in a while. Mm-hmm. You know who has the most strikeouts in MLB history, right? Who? Babe Ruth. I didn't know that. Yeah. See, but that's because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not like a mm-hmm. sports stats guy, but it's true though, right? Yeah. Michael gotta, Jordan the same way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he's, you got to take the shot. Mm-hmm. You got to keep shooting. the shot. Yeah. Or you keep hacking at those thistles. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me tell you, thistles suck. <laughs> they are truly, they are truly devil spawn. I mean, they are really awful. I mean, they're pretty flowers, but. <laughs> yeah. I had, I had one farmer that wanted, he, he thought if you just cut them down and you didn't burn them, they'd keep spreading. So he'd make me dig them up. 
Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. Really sucks. Yeah. Wow. That sounds mm-hmm. awful. So anyways, that's a total tangent. We can get rid of all this stuff in this thing, but <laughs> well, no. That's well, that's just you that pivot from the sports good. analogy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> Dig up one. your thistles. The persistence. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if any of our listeners um, want to learn more about you or Tesla, where should they go? Well, definitely they go to teslarsoftware.com, uh, our website. If they want to know me, best place, I'm on LinkedIn, been on LinkedIn for a long time, since 2008, early day. So just Joe Earhart is my LinkedIn name. So uh, with no numbers or anything, just Joe Earhart. And now Earhart's hard to spell, but look me up on LinkedIn. <laughs> we'll put the show notes. Yeah, we'll, we'll get yeah. in the notes. Or you can also email me. I, I respond to most emails a uh, reasonable time. <laughs> Joe at Tesla or software. Yeah, I you're, say you're busy. I say reasonable time because my, everyone in the company hates this, but I am a person of, I only work on highest priority first. So if yeah. you email me and it's going to take more than a yes or no, mm-hmm. and you're not high priority, I flag you and it might take me a week so to come back star, to it. Yeah. Star, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll star yeah. it, flag it, and it yeah. may take me a week to come back yeah. to it. So, LinkedIn, a little bit quicker sometimes because mm-hmm. I looked at it on my phone. Mm-hmm. Or you can come to Startup Crawl because Tesla will be a beer sponsor. That's true. We we do like to sponsor beer. I don't know yeah. if that's appropriate for bankers. But <laughs> it oh, seems like sure. what we do all the time. We just sure keep sponsoring. Hey, they need to have a good time. Yeah, right? exactly. We're willing to have a good time. <laughs> thanks for coming on. And thanks for all you do for the ecosystem and in building a great company. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. And I don't know, I didn't say it earlier, but uh, I went through a lot of your programs. So we wouldn't be here without Startup Junkies. And it, and it shows. <laughs> yeah. I, that's right. That's why we're awesome. <laughs> this is a picture of Startup Junkie program. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Well, thank you for yeah. coming on. Yep. Thanks, great. guys. Yeah. Ecosystem builders, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, mayors. If you're interested in taking your economic future into your own hands, we've got a book that can help you. Creating Startup Junkies, Building Sustainable Venture Ecosystems in Unexpected Places is the guide. It's a little bit inspiration. It's a little bit toolkit. What it will allow you to do is take your economic future into your own hands and build a sustainable small business innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in your backyard. If you'd like to hear more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. The Startup Junkie podcast reaches over 100 countries and has had over 100,000 downloads. If you're interested in reaching some of the most motivated and engaged innovators and entrepreneurs on a worldwide basis, give us a shout.